Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you about the Europe project and the great progress that's been made. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale for the project. Um, I'd like to start by uh, saying that <clears throat> the FBI recently published a report, uh, and this is uh, 2018, and they said no single reason explains why people become violent extremists. But those who are emotionally upset after a stress stressful event may be vulnerable to recruitment. Now, that idea that a stressful event could be a precursor to violent radicalization is really very close to the truth. But how many people here in their lives have experienced emotional upset due to a stressful event? Everybody, yes. So, so the thing is that that insight that they have is not very useful in terms of tracking down people who are potentially terrorists, because by that definition, we all are. The, the problem is that what they have not yet discovered um, is that it is possible to make the physiology resilient so that what is a stressful event to one person is not a stressful event to another person. So we need to look at the causes of stress and how to deal with stress. So the Quiet Time Transcendental Meditation Program is a way to deal with stress and to make the children more resilient to stress. And we know, as we'll see in a moment, that stress actually damages the physiology. So we know that stress damages the brain, and we know that stress damages the physiology. So that what we need is a way to combat stress. And I'm going to be very confused here. Okay. So we need to decrease stress levels in education, because if you think of the logic, if stress damages the brain, then we need to have an educational system that does not create stress in the student, because education is supposed to develop the brain, not to damage the brain. So trying to develop an educational system that does not stress the student is on the face of it, a big challenge, but we'll see actually there's a simple solution. So here are the, some of the students in the project in Portugal, and you see they don't look very stressed. <laughs> and what they're doing is practicing transcendental meditation. So there may be people here who don't practice transcendental meditation, so I'll just take a moment to explain what is happening. Um, meditation has been part of human tradition since time immemorial, but it was in the late 1960s and early 1970s that Western science became interested in meditation. And the first paper on transcendental meditation was published in Science Magazine by Dr. Keith Wallace in 1970. What had happened was in the uh, late 1950s and early 1960s, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi uh, brought this technology of consciousness, this transcendental meditation, from its ancient roots in India to, to the West. And since he was trained as a scientist at school, he knew that if something was beneficial, then scientists would want to study it. And this is what has happened. So since 1970, there have now been over 650 scientific studies on transcendental meditation. And there are many, many, many forms of meditation. And they all have different techniques. And the unique thing about transcendental meditation is that it is effortless, that it is natural. Um, so let's look at this idea of a meditation technique being effortless. 
when people think of meditation, very often they're thinking that, oh, I can't do it because it involves concentration. So who, who can concentrate for a long period? Not many people. Certainly you couldn't go to a school and say, we want you to concentrate for 15 minutes. Um, there would be a lot of uh, upheaval in the classroom after 30 seconds. So firstly, it doesn't involve concentration. It, it doesn't involve contemplation. Contemplation means we think about something or we're witnessing our th thoughts or witnessing ideas. And contemplation may have some value in creating a mood. So if we sit and we think of the ocean or we think of beautiful mountains with Edelweiss, etc., that may have some effect. But that's not transcendental meditation. Transcendental meditation has this word transcendental in front of it because transcendental means to go beyond. So you go beyond thinking, go beyond thought to the source of thinking. And at the source of thinking is this field of pure silence, pure consciousness, we call it. Why does the mind go to that area in transcendental meditation? Because the nature of the human mind is to always be moving towards more fulfillment. If you think about it, when you get up in the morning, nobody gets up in the morning and says, yesterday was awful, I hope today is going to be worse. That is not the human condition. We wake up optimistic that something good is going to happen today because our mind is always looking for something more fulfilling. Now, we can find fulfillment outside of ourselves. So we have many things that people do in our society. They go to sports events, they go to the cinema, they play games on the internet, they have their family, they have all of these things that bring them fulfillment. But actually, deep within all of us is a field of pure fulfillment. At the source of thinking is a field of, we could call it blissfulness, uh, charming, uh, the source of all of our happiness actually turns out to be within us. So transcendental meditation makes use of the nature of the human mind to go to more fulfilling areas of life by allowing us to turn our attention inward and then the mind spontaneously goes within to that source of happiness which is already within us. So we've grown up in our society always focusing outwards. You know, at school we were looking at books, we were looking at the internet, we were, everything was involved in gaining knowledge, or as Fabrizio said, exploring outside of ourselves. So science began. Why? Because people wanted to explore the material universe and go deeper, deeper, molecular level, atomic level, nuclear level. Now, science has glimpsed this field of unity at the basis of the physical universe. We hear so much about unified quantum field theories today. But very little attention was put on exploring within. And so transcendental meditation allows the mind to dive deeply within and explore finer levels of awareness. Transcendental meditation is also natural. It's natural because it does not involve concentration and it does not involve contemplation. It makes use of the natural tendency of the mind to experience fields of more or more bliss. So given the right technique, the mind dives within like a bee to nectar, just automatically because those subtler levels of thinking are more blissful and more, and more charming. So oops. here's a diagram that illustrates this. So this is the surface thinking level of the mind. So this is making an analogy between an ocean and the mind. You see on the surface of the ocean, there are waves. This is like the thoughts that we have on the surface level of the mind. All day long, we're having thoughts. The mind is active. In Transcendental Meditation, we take a thought, experience that thought at finer levels in the development of the thought. This happens spontaneously. And we experience that at the source of thought is this field of silence, this field of transcendental consciousness. Just like with an ocean, 
you can be tossed around on the surface of the ocean by all of these huge waves, which are happening all the time, but if you dive deep into the ocean, you find that underlying the dynamism on the surface is always a field of silence. You can have a hurricane go by up here with huge waves, but down here, it's always silent. And that is what has been missed from society, that we have this field of dynamic silence within us. Now, I say dynamic silence because you might think, well, silence doesn't, you know, it might be nice, but it doesn't sound very useful. It's rather like a bow and arrow. You can have different types of silence. You can put the arrow on the bow, and it's silent, but it's not dynamic silence. In order to get dynamic silence, you have to pull the arrow back on the bow. Now it's still silent, but now it's full of potential. And when you let go, then it can fly far. So the students who are practicing transcendental meditation, what they're doing is the mind dives within to this field of dynamic silence, which is the source of their creativity and intelligence. So when they come out of meditation, as you'll see from the results this afternoon, they're much more creative, much more intelligent, much calmer because they have this silence which is established in their awareness. So just to make this point again, so here is our system of education today, how we all grew up. We used to focus on books. Today they focus on the internet. It's the same thing. The attention is directed outwards to the knowledge. And this has created huge progress in society. What modern education has developed is the ability to control and manipulate the physical universe, to gain deeper insights into the laws of nature. But what has been missing is the development of the student. So to give you an example, it's estimated today that in the United States, where the progress in the material level, like in Europe, is at the cutting edge, that more than 50% of adult population are taking prescription drugs to deal with mental problems like insomnia and anxiety and depression and all of these different things that the progress on the outside has not been matched by progress on the inside. And this is the missing link that transcendental meditation fulfills. So, the need is, oh, I should have mentioned, sorry, I just meant to say this. Um, if we want to develop the student, then what is the thing in the physiology that determines our behavior? We could say everything depends on the functioning of the brain. If the brain, if we're uh, in a very sleepy state of consciousness, then we're not going to see things very clearly. We could be dreaming, in which case we don't see anything clearly. We see a completely illusory universe. And we experience the waking state of consciousness, where, again, if we're sleepy, we don't have such a good day. If we're wide awake and alert, the day goes better. So what Maharishi pointed out was that the human being can experience different states of consciousness. Sleeping state of consciousness we've all experienced. Dreaming state of consciousness. Hopefully everyone here is now in the waking state. In the back row, we'll have a look. Um, those are three states of consciousness. But what Dr. Wallace's paper in 1970 pointed out is that there is actually a fourth major state of human consciousness, completely different from waking, sleeping, and dreaming. Because this fourth state of consciousness is described as a state of restful alertness, just like the arrow pulled back on the bow. So when you're practicing transcendental meditation, because mind and body are intimately related, as the mental activity settles down to this state of inner silence, the physiology settles down to a deep level of rest and relaxation. And in that deep level of rest and relaxation, the body is able to repair damage that has been caused by overload of stress. So deep rest is a very important factor in this technique. At the same time, the mind is fully alert. So it's completely different to sleep. So in restful alertness, you have rest in the body 
and alertness in the mind. And we'll see in a moment what happens to the <clears throat> brain of the student when they're practicing transcendental meditation. So this is the, the next part. So we've talked about the need to combat stress. Transcendental meditation, as you'll see in the research presented later, is the most effective way of reducing the harmful side effects of stress. It's simple, it's natural, it's effortless, and it's effective. But we also want to optimize brain functioning. So let's look at the human brain. Essentially, this is a very simple look, outlook, there are two parts to the brain. There's the part of the brain we could call the impulsive brain or the animal brain. This is the part of the brain that we have in common with animals. So we have, you know, the visual cortex and the motor cortex and the cerebellum all in common. What is the big difference between us and an animal? It's that we have this fully developed prefrontal cortex. This is the thinking brain. So if you have a brain where the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, then you may not have good impulse control. You may act on impulse, and many, many acts of violence occur because of lack of impulse control. And you can lose impulse control by interfering with the prefrontal cortex. For example, if you, if you have someone who drinks alcohol, alcohol suppresses the activity of the prefrontal cortex, and that's why so many crimes and acts of violence are related to alcohol consumption. So this is the prefrontal cortex, the humanity that we have, responsible for, as I mentioned, impulse control. It's responsible for long-term planning, something animals don't do very much. So you've never seen a cow packing a suitcase and planning a holiday. You, they, they can't do that, but we can. Uh, concentration, working memory, uh, emotional stability, it's also in the prefrontal cortex. Learning ability, self-awareness, and very importantly for our topic today, ethical thinking, moral reasoning. It's here, and we know this from neuroscience because people who've had damage to the prefrontal cortex, they lose these abilities. So it's be very important to have some technology that could develop the prefrontal cortex. So here's Dr. Fred Travis, uh, director of the Center of Brain Consciousness and Cognition. And here he's looking at the functioning of the brain with the electroencephalograph. And I'd like to show you now a very two minute brief movie of what happens when you learn transcendental meditation to your prefrontal cortex, something very concrete. So what, the goal, what we find in this program then is we can add a missing element to education because if you're a teacher in the classroom, you take the students that the parents provide you with and then you use all of your skill to try to develop them. But if you don't have a way of developing the coherent functioning of the student's brain, teaching is always a big challenge. When you have a technology to make the brain coherent, teaching becomes absolutely blissful. Yes, please. So we could call the prefrontal cortex the executive brain. It's the chief executive officer of the brain. It governs all of the other parts of, of the brain if it's working properly. So this is the left side of the prefrontal cortex. This is the right side of the prefrontal cortex. You're looking here at the electrical activity. This is a few microvolts measured by the leads of the electroencephalogram. And here you see there's a certain amplitude and so you have many millions of cells functioning and all of the electrical impulses are adding together to give you this very noisy output. So here is the right side of the prefrontal cortex. And here we're looking at a measure of the coherence, which means the degree of communication between the left and right sides of the prefrontal cortex. And you see it goes from up and down from basically 100% here. Here's 100% coherence down to very near to zero coherence. So it's very incoherent, that's what I should say. Now the person is asked to begin transcendental meditation. They're sitting here with their eyes closed now. So here they are sitting with eyes closed. You don't see any change. And then this is where they begin transcendental meditation. So what you're seeing here is locally, the cells, the neurons are firing coherently together, giving you a much larger amplitude 
and the same thing on the right, but very interestingly, you now see that the coherence between the left and the right has increased to about 100%. So you're looking at a completely unique style of brain functioning where you have perfect communication between different areas of the brain. Now here we're only looking at the prefrontal cortex, but it's very striking. So the child, or the student, or the adult, they practice transcendental meditation for 15 to 20 minutes, and then they come out of meditation, and this coherence persists in their activity. And then later in the afternoon, they meditate again, the brain becomes coherent, then they have their activity in the evening, the next day they meditate again, they have their activity, and the brain is so flexible that over time, the high coherence is maintained even when you're not meditating. And that's when it's really useful. I mean, it would be one thing if your brain was coherent in meditation, great, but if it was incoherent later on, it wouldn't be so good. You want the, the coherence to continue. So we'll look at the next slide. So I'm going to show you now uh, what the whole brain looks like. We just saw between the left and right prefrontal cortex. This is from the uh, Journal of Psychophysiology and the International Journal of Neuroscience. This is with eyes open, looking at the coherence between different areas of the brain. And you see, every time the coherence rises above a certain threshold, the computer draws a line between those two areas of the brain. So with eyes open, you don't see very much. With eyes closed, you see a little bit more at the back of the brain because it's resting. This is the occipital cortex. But during transcendental meditation, you see a completely holistic style of brain functioning. Every area of the brain is communicating with every other area of the brain, and in particular, the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the animal brain are being strengthened. So the chief executive officer is now taking control of the brain, and that means all of these higher human values, like impulse control, ethical thinking, moral reasoning, are starting to grow in the life of the individual. So suddenly you start to find, as you saw from that report of Maharishi School in Britain, that suddenly the children start to behave in the way that you want them to behave, to grow into good citizens. You don't have to keep telling them how to behave. Every teacher knows that if you keep telling children you have to behave like this, you have to behave like this, as soon as you turn your back, you'll find they're not behaving like this. Because intellectual understanding of morality is not enough. It has to come spontaneously from the proper functioning of the brain itself. So we saw from that last slide, it, it seems from the research we could say today that it's only the experience of transcendental consciousness that enlivens total brain functioning. This is an amazing discovery. Everything we do changes our brain. Everything you eat changes your brain. If you play football, it changes your brain. That's why footballers practice eight hours a day. If you play the violin, it changes your brain. If you study mathematics, it changes your brain. All of these things change your brain, but they tend to only develop parts of the brain. So a footballer who's always practicing trying to get better with their left foot is developing the motor cortex here that governs the left foot. A violinist is developing the motor cortex that moves the fingers of the left hand. But that's not enough. You have to have something that develops the whole brain, and the great shock, if you like, the great discovery, is that what develops the whole brain? The experience of pure consciousness, the experience of silence, the one thing that they never gave us at school. Right? They gave us mathematics, they gave us sports, they gave us philosophy, they gave us ethics, they gave us music, they gave absolutely everything except the experience of pure consciousness. But ironically, it's only the experience of transcendental consciousness that develops the whole brain. This is why now education, the future of education is so bright, because now we have a way of every child, irrespective of their intelligence, irrespective of their religion, irrespective of their abilities, every child, without exception, can do this. So this is just to give you an insight into the benefits of having a brain that is highly coherent. Many randomized control studies 
have shown that higher brain coherence leads to many beautiful qualities. For example, greater self-awareness is correlated with higher brain coherence. Greater inner orientation, improved neurological efficiency, increased moral reasoning ability, increased creativity, increased intelligence, better marks in school, uh, increased emotional subtlety, better, much lower trait anxiety and state anxiety, um, and decreased neuroticism. So it's rather like watering the root of a tree. If we look on education as bearing all these fruits, we're trying to polish this fruit, and we're trying to polish this fruit, and polish this fruit. Now we understand how to develop every fruit, and that is we water the root. And watering the root in this context means developing higher brain coherence in the student, and then they become spontaneously better at everything. And that's what we see in so much of the research. If you're a mathematics teacher, what you'll find is that when the children learn transcendental meditation, their brain becomes more, more coherent, they spontaneously become better at mathematics. They spontaneously learn languages better. They spontaneously begin to behave better. So this is really the key that should be added to every school as just part of the routine of the school day. So here are some students. Again, this is our project in Portugal. Um, you see a wide variety of students, but this is actually quite an amazing thing that you can get students who are 12 years old to gladly sit quietly for 12 to 15 minutes. I was so impressed when I visited the school. I got there about 8.20 in the morning. School starts at 8.30. There were lots of children running around in the, in the playground and went up to a classroom as so I was going to visit the first class. And already the students were lined up outside. They didn't want to miss their meditation. It was really an amazing experience. This is the school in uh, Holland and this is school in, uh, in Sweden. So now, as we mentioned, as Myrta mentioned, it's expanding. So this was, is a great innovation, uh, a great support from the European Commission, and something that is going to eradicate the problems associated with um, social inclusion. So let me just read a, a little section here from a uh, professor in the United States at Indiana University. He says, repeated exposure to stress can result in long-term damage to the brain's frontal, frontal cortex that we don't want. This frontal lobe damage could lead to a situation where the brain is damaged so badly that the individual becomes at risk for terrorism without the human emotions of pity or remorse. So, now we can avoid that. It's not that we have to look for a needle in a haystack and say, oh, this person is at danger of radicalization and this person is not. Now we can essentially inoculate the whole society against the harmful effects of stress. As the World Health Organization said, we're living in an ocean of stress. Stress is the modern plague. It's damaging the human physiologies all over the world and our children are drowning in stress. So now we have a simple antidote to stress that will make the future of education very bright. Thank you very much.